One night in 2004, I was rushed to the hospital with chest pains, fever, nausea, shortness of breath, kind of how I felt yesterday, but I mean, this was in 2004. All the symptoms of a heart attack. And in the emergency room, they hooked me up to a monitor and they took a blood test. And you know, that's two key ways to determine if that was really my problem. I thought I was having a heart attack. My wife thought I was having a heart attack. Even the person in the intake thing said, no, go right in, uh, you're having a heart attack. But they, they don't just take your word for it in the ER. You know, they, <laughs> they do tests, thankfully. Later, they took me for an X-ray, an ultrasound test, and these tests finally determined what my real problem was. I had an infected gallbladder, not the same. All to say, it's amazing how a key test can reveal where and what your health problem really is. I'm glad they didn't you know, crack me open and start working on my heart. You know, I took a, a test first. Well, there are similar tests. I think you see where I'm going here. There are similar tests in the spiritual world that help determine the spiritual health and well-being of an individual. For example, how often you take the time to pray and to, and to read God's word determines how healthy your private relationship is with the Lord. Uh, perhaps what ministry that you're involved in speaks to the, the type of gift that you have for service in the church. Uh, the percentage of money that you give to the Lord compared to how much you keep for yourself reveals the true extent of your love for him. So there are many such tests, but the one that is the most basic and determines the overall spiritual health and maturity and strength is church attendance. That's the general test. That's the test you know, that's easy to, easy to spot if there's illness, if there's something not okay. And so uh, of all the tests that evaluate our spiritual health, I'd like to talk about this one, attendance, church attendance, and answer the most asked question about uh, church attendance. And, and I've heard it you know, for 40 years. You know, do I have to be there every time? <laughs> Even Marty's shaking his head on now. Do I have to be there every time? Probably the question many people want to ask and don't say so out loud. I believe that there, there's a problem even if you have to ask this question. I mean, it's like the student who asks, how many pages minimum for the report? You know, the teacher's giving out, you gotta have a report, you know, and there's always one guy in the back, you know, miss, miss, you know, yes. What's the minimum number of pages that we have to have you know, for the assignment. It's like asking for the explanation for a joke or, or, or like uh, ordering somebody to tell you that they love you, you know. It speaks to attitude. It speaks to attitude. You know, the, the, the gathering of the saints for worship, for work, for fellowship is actually a new lifestyle. It's, it's not a, you know, I got it, you know, a box you check off. It's a, it's a lifestyle uh, for work, for fellowship. It's all a lifestyle that we enter into and we develop as we grow in Christ. I want to read a, a, a key passage here. It has to do with this idea of uh, lifestyle in Acts chapter two. It said, so then those who had received his word, meaning Peter who was preaching, so then uh, who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves. Oh, I love that. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Now this passage here is not just a comment on how things were, but actually an example for us to follow as to how things ought to be right here in Chakta. What is it that we can't do that they were just doing? Is there anything mentioned here that we cannot do today? Well, other than the temple, you know, going to the temple, but continuing with each other and praying with each other and having fellowship with each other, eating in each other's homes, coming together to pray, to worship, to study, to take the communion, to praise God. Is there anything that we cannot do today that they did at that time? Of course not. This was an example for us and all other Christians uh, after this period was over. We need, to, we need to manage our lifestyle and our activities and our work in order to move as closely as possible to this goal. The problem is this was the goal, this was the pattern for Christian lifestyle. They lived together and being together and sharing together and working together and praising together, a lot of together provided momentum to the church, excitement to the church, spiritual energy for the church. And notice the very last verse, it says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were uh, being saved. That's how the church grows. Our homes, our jobs, our feelings, our recreation uh, cannot bring us closer to God than gathering with the saints. Gathering with the saints is the activity uh, and the avenue to, to getting closer to God. So tonight, as you already know, I want to give you three very good reasons why each Christian should be at every service of the church. Now, of course, I'm preaching to the choir. It's a rainy Sunday night, you know, lousy weather, it's dark out and you're all here on a Sunday night. So uh, please don't take it as a rebuke instead Take it, uh, take it as an encouragement, okay? Three good reasons for us to get together, to be together, to worship together every time we have the opportunity. And I'll give you a fourth one. I got three written down, but I've just thought of a fourth one. And the way things are going, I better give you the one I'm thinking of now because I won't remember it. Uh, when I give you the three that I bothered to write down. The fourth one is, we might not have the opportunity. We might not have the opportunity one of these days to gather together. It, it might be dangerous or it might be difficult. Right now it's just inconvenient. That's the fourth one. So you got the fourth one first, all right? Three good reasons to attend every service. Number one, being here every time pleases God. David says, I will praise the name of God with song and shall magnify him with thanksgiving and it will please the Lord. God has always desired that his people gather to worship him and that they do so often. He likes this. It pleases him when we get together to worship him. Isaiah in Isaiah 56 says the following, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, 
even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. God will not be satisfied only with the prayers of the Jewish people. He's saying here through Isaiah, I will only be satisfied when all the people gather together, when all of the people all over the world, no matter what culture they are, what language they are, when all of them, what color they are, come together to worship me. This is the goal for all nations to be in the, in the house of the Lord. God desires that we be involved in this type of activity when we are together rather than pursuing worldly pleasures. You always have a choice of activities to do on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, but worshiping will always, will always be the choice that pleases the Lord. I'll say it again, it'll always be what pleases the Lord. And I know what you're thinking. Well, what if somebody is hurt by the side of the road on my way? Of course. Of course, but for the purpose of my lesson, if you have simply the choice of watching TV or mowing your lawn or catching up on your bookkeeping, worshiping God will be the thing that will please uh, the Lord. Paul says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart uh, to the Lord. God desires, as I say, that we be involved in this type of activity. This is what uh, pleases he. Now Hebrews uh, 13, 15 to 16, it says, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It pleases God to see us offering praise. He was pleased in the Old Testament and he is pleased to this day by these activities. Some Christians don't realize or perhaps have forgotten that pleasing God is what our lives as Christian are about. You've never thought, what's my life about? Well, what should I be doing? What should I be shooting for? What should I be aiming for with my life? I've got a handicap, I've got a restriction, I've got this, I've got that, so God, you know, what do I do to please you? Well, you know, worship, <laughs> worship Him is what pleases him. Bring him sacrifices of praise is what pleases him. To know and glorify God is essential if we're to find true meaning for our lives. When we worship God, we know that we are doing the right thing. That's why it's so satisfying. When we worship God in spirit and truth, we have reached the core value of what our life is about. You see, not coming to a worship service requires an excuse of some kind. I mean, some of them are valid, all kidding aside, you know, people have to work. Sometimes we're ill. Sometimes we're taking care of someone who, you know, there, there are valid reasons for not being with the saints when the saints gather, we know that. But being here uh, 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 never requires an excuse. You ever notice that? We never have to give an excuse for going to church. We always have to you know, find an excuse because we're not at service when service is taking place. But when we go to service, we, I, I've never apologized to anybody for going to worship God. Most people want to please uh, the ones they love. This is normal, this is plain truth. Being here for every worship service pleases God and demonstrates our love uh, for Him. It's not the only way, we know that. Loving our brother, 
forgiving those who offend us, you know, turning the other, all those things please God, but I'm not preaching about all those other things, I'm preaching about worship. And I know that worship, I know it because the Bible teaches that worship pleases God. The problem, however, is that we would rather please ourselves and make church attendance, we'd rather make it convenient or fun or easy or exciting or pleasing, you know, uh, as a motivation. You want to motivate me to come to church? May make it more pleasing. Change it around somehow so it's a little more fun. We forget that the object of worship is to please God, not ourselves. We're not here to please ourselves. It may be inconvenient to be here on a rainy day, or if you've got, if you've got small children, or if you, your hip is hurting because of the, the humidity, you know, a thousand and one reasons, of course. It's not always easy, but that's not the point. Another reason for uh, attending all the services, being here every time strengthens our faith. When people have problems and you ask them what they need, many times before they mention food or finances, they're going to reach out for greater faith. You know, uh, the 9-11 victims in New York many years back, they had all kinds of financial assistance that was given to them, but they asked for help with their faith during that time of crisis. Even uh, many of the presidents that we have had uh, who command the most powerful military in all of history, what does that man ask for when he asks the nation for something? He asks the nation to pray for him so that his faith will not falter. The apostles witnessed God's miracles and they performed mighty deeds themselves. But when it came time to ask for something, what did they ask Jesus? Well, they asked him to increase their faith in Luke uh, chapter 17. Faith is not only necessary for salvation, but it's also necessary to be able to manage the many ups and downs of life so we can hang on uh, to that salvation. You know, such an important thing, faith. How do you acquire it? How do you maintain it? How do you increase it? How do you, how do you strengthen it? Paul says very simply that faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. In Romans 10, verse 17. All the activities in the world combined together do not add a single drop to our faith. Hearing and sharing the word, singing praises to God, prayer, communion, giving, receiving and giving ministry, these are the things that spark and maintain and strengthen our faith. The things that you need to do in order to maintain your spiritual life, things such as resisting sin or persevering while in suffering or the doing of good when it's, when it's, uh, when it's difficult or bearing the spiritual fruit. All of these things are based on the strength of your faith and the strength of your faith is proportional to your exposure to God's word and God's uh, people. There are no shortcuts in building uh, your faith. Uh, weak attendance equals weak faith equals weak Christians. Strong faith and the fruit that comes from it is usually a result of much teaching. And for most Christians, that usually comes through faithful attendance. Of course, in this type of discussion, someone will invariably ask the following question. Well, if I only come to Sunday morning worship and I skip the rest, will I still go to heaven? And my answer is, I don't know. But your question does tell me you have an attitude problem. Doing only what you have to do. You know what that is? That's legalism. Doing only what you have to do is legalism. This attitude will ultimately lead you to fall from grace altogether because you're trying to get there with religious works and minimum religious works at that. <laughs> 
This type of question reveals a lack of knowledge regarding the faith to begin with. This person who asks this question needs to come to church, not just to increase attendance level, this person needs to come more often so they will learn more about God's grace and be free from the curse of legalism. Because if a person keeps this type of attitude, no amount of church attendance will save them. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying if you don't come to Wednesday church or Sunday night church, you're going to hell. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you think in terms of attendance as some kind of brownie points, you're a legalist and being a legalist is what endangers your soul, not your attendance level. What I am saying is that we are saved by faith. We walk by faith. We can move mountains by faith. We please God by faith and that faith is conceived and nourished every time you attend worship service. So why attend every time? Because your faith needs for you to be here in order to stay alive and healthy spiritually. One more reason to be here every time. Being here every time builds uh, the church. Familiar scripture here, Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, the problem here was that the Jewish Christians were weak in their faith and they were being tempted to return to Judaism. Their absence from the assembly contributed to their weak faith and their weak faith was not sustaining them under pressure. In addition to this, their absence was hurting other people. This is why he encourages them not to abandon the assembly and he exhorts them to give a, a good example and a word of encouragement to others uh, as well. Your presence at all services is critical in the building up of the church because through regular attendance, you do several things for other people. For example, you proclaim Christ to each other and to the community, uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. You know, the full parking lot on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night would be a tremendous witness of faith for our congregation and our beliefs to our community. Yeah, everybody, everybody expects the parking lot to be full on Sunday morning, of course. Theirs is full across the street and over on the other corner. Theirs is full and ours is full. You know, big deal. That's what, you know, Christians, yeah, they all do that no matter where they are. But theirs is empty on Sunday night and ours is a third full on Sunday night. See what I'm saying? The person who doesn't come to church drives by and goes, wow, I wonder what's going on there on Sunday night. Must be a big, you know, must be a big thing happening because the parking lot is full. Thinking it's a one-time event and then they come by the following Sunday night and the parking lot is full again. Well, what is, what is going on? Must be something special. People, are impressed by the strangest things uh, sometimes. You also provide a godly example to other people. Have you ever asked yourselves what your absence from services on a regular basis says to children or younger Christians or visitors? Worst case scenario, and I think all of you who have kind of reached out and tried to invite people to church, somebody comes in, a visitor, and you know, one of our people greets them, hi, how's it going, blah, 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 you know, and uh, how you doing, nice to have you with us. And I usually say, 
do you know someone here? Are you looking for someone? Let me help you find that person. You know, just to start a bit of a conversation or something to help them. And they say, yes, my buddy from work, Joe, uh, invited me to church this Sunday. <laughs> And Joe's not here. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, Joe, Joe. And, and worse still, you're thinking, Joe, who, Joe? I'm not sure I even know who Joe is here. What an example to set. What a poor example to set. Other Christians, younger Christians, need to see mature Christians take seriously their attendance at worship so a, a high standard can be established for them to, to emulate. When we, when we gather regularly, we contribute to the needs of the saints, 1 Corinthians 16. When we're here regularly, we contribute more than money. We contribute a solid example, a, an action of encouragement, a witness of love uh, for the church. Um, not so much here because we have a fairly good sized church, but if any of you have ever been a member of a small church, I mean a small church, under 100 people, let's say 80 people. In Montreal, the church there was like that, mission, you know, mission church started with just a few people in our living room you know, and it grew and, you know, and eventually we had a small building and you know, we had 75, 85 people. You know. And I remember those days, every person who would come in the door on a Sunday, the, you know, we'd be maybe uh, uh, 20 minutes before services, there'd only be nine people there. You know? And then, oops, two more people would come in. Hey, 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 come on in, nice to see you. I'm glad you, know, you came. I mean, they're members. And you could see the, the people who were there, the, the folks who got there early, the members who got there early, with every new person coming in the building, it was like they were being, you know, like they stuck a, a, a pump, you know, they were being pumped up. Every single person that walked in, oh, hey, hi, come on in, oh, look at that, four more people, sure, come on in, let's go. It was so encouraging, not just for me, the preacher, it was so encouraging for the entire church to see the place kind of fill up with not only our members, but hey, Sister Josephine, it's either Joe or Josephine, okay. So Sister Josephine, you know, she invited you know, her grandson and her granddaughter to come and we've got visitors, you know. Here we, we, don't, we don't even announce the visitors, right? I, mean, I, don't, I don't think we mean to be disrespectful, but we don't want to miss anybody is usually the, the thing. We, we don't, we're not sure. But in a small church, oh boy, you announce the visitors. Yeah, you know, Sister Josephine brought her. How about standing up? You know, <laughs> the church is excited when, when people were coming, when people of a like mind and of a like faith shared their conviction about being there. Never mind Sunday morning, Wednesday night, I mean, just crank that up three or four times because Wednesday night, we didn't expect all 85 to be there. <laughs> so when we got past the 25 mark, we were really excited then. Your presence encourages others. And we also support the leaders we demonstrate our support of the leaders and the ministers of the church who are charged with leading and feeding the flock, Hebrews 13, seven. How would, you like to, how would you like to cook and nobody show up for your meal? That's what the preacher does all week. That's what the teachers do. We always talk about the preacher, but you know, the teachers in all the classes, uh, you know, my own wife participates in that and my daughters and I see them coloring stuff and making paper and you know, planning their lesson and oh, I've got to get a, a, an activity ready and oh, I've got to run down to wherever the store is you know, to get that stuff. And they're busy after work or they're getting their lesson ready for their kiddos. And their kiddos don't show up. <laughs> All that work for nothing. I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip here. I'm just saying the elders have 
of course, wisely set Sunday morning uh, as a time for worship, simply because the Bible instructs us, you know, that uh, on the Lord's day we meet for communion and so they have, you know, uh, made this building and organized the service, but they've also wisely added a Wednesday night service and a Sunday night service. Why? Well, for all the reasons I've just given, to build our faith and to strengthen us and to encourage each other and so on and so forth. I don't remember anyone saying, we'll meet on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings if you feel like it. Submission to those who are over us in the Lord, as Hebrews says, also includes the cooperation of the members attending at the times that the leaders have set. We need to remember that you know, regular church attendance by all the members at all the services is the first step to church growth and usually the first step to personal spiritual growth as well. I'm sure that there would be great excitement if there were 500 people meeting regularly here at the Choctaw congregation. This would motivate change. This would motivate personal initiative. I mean, we'd have to do stuff. If all of a sudden, never mind 500, if all the people that are on the rolls were here on Sunday morning, we'd have to change things because we, we wouldn't have enough room in the classrooms, we wouldn't have enough bathrooms you know, to service anyone. Nobody would be angry about that. The elders wouldn't be going into their elders meeting and you know, slap their Bibles down on the table and say, oh no, all the people showed up. What's wrong with them? Now we gotta, <laughs> we gotta find a way to you know, expand the building or you know what I'm saying? Should we go to tell, oh, what a pain in the neck. You, know? you think that would be the conversation? Well, they'd be praising God. Bring it on is right. Of course, all of this will never happen if we don't get the ones who are supposed to be here, here. Never mind bringing new people here. I repeat, you can't have church growth, spiritual or numerical, unless every single member is committed to being faithful at every service. When the most experienced minister to the most recent convert accepts the fact that putting the kingdom of heaven first in your life begins with the very humble and simple task of coming to church regularly, then the Lord will trust us with the kind of growth personally and corporately that we seek after, that we say we want. Now at this part of my lesson, I usually offer an invitation to those who you know, want to confess Christ and be baptized and those who need prayer to come forward to be recognized. And if this is your intention, then by all means, if you were planning today, okay, tonight I'm coming forward and I'm going to be baptized, by all means, come forward. The baptistry is ready. The church is here to hear your confession of faith. But tonight, however, I want to make two other invitations that are more in line you know, with what I, I just finished preaching. You know, um, at the morning service, the brethren would tell me that with this sermon, uh, I've gone you know, from preaching to meddling because I've, you know, I'm talking about our personal habits and people don't like that. They like to talk about things that are wrong with other people, but they, they, don't, you know, they don't like talking about their personal uh, things. But brothers and sisters, after being here, uh, 11 years, I was counting it the other day, 11 years that Lise and I came back from Montreal, 20, 25 years actually in all that, that Lise and I have served the Choctaw congregation, but 11 years this last go around. And, and I've observed our pattern of attendance and I think it's time for some serious meddling from the preacher. So let's pretend that everyone was here this evening. And if they were here, here's the invitation that I, want, I would make. Those who don't come to all services regularly, please realize that pleasing God more fully and strengthening your faith and making a real contribution to this church requires you to change. 
I encourage you not to be angry or proud, but rather to humble yourself in Christ and repent. Make it your goal to be faithful to all the surfaces each week, even if it means starting slowly, adding an additional time as you rearrange your schedule to accommodate this change, if it's possible. And yes, of course, some people have someone sick they have to take care of. Some pe people themselves are sick and can't come. Yes, all that being equal, okay? I'm talking to the other 95% of people who are subject to this lesson. Make it your goal to be faithful to all the services each week, again, even if it means starting slowly. Of course, as I said, some work, some are sick, but you know if your excuse is a valid one before the Lord. So make the necessary changes if, if you need to. And then the other one, second invitation, if you do come regularly, even to all the weekly services, then look around and see what you can do to serve or to encourage or to help other people. If you've established the first step of Christian development in regular attendance, then take the second and the third step of learning how to minister to others in the church. I, I could be, uh, it could be as simple as uh, making sure you greet warmly as many as you can at each service. Uh, perhaps uh, you could volunteer to help when we ask for volunteers. Uh, again, we asked for volunteers this morning. Uh, last week we talked about VBS, uh, getting volunteers for VBS. Uh, or Brother Steve Harrison, has encouraged us to send notes of encouragement to one another. We need help in the nursery and in the playroom. We're looking for teachers and prayer leaders and people to mow the lawn. You know, I mean, there's so much to do. You know, during the COVID slowdown, a lot of people complained about how various ministries were done or not done. But now that we're starting up again, we're having a hard time finding people to, to start uh, servicing, uh, serving once again. Jesus says that the church will prevail against the gates of hell, and that includes uh, the recent pandemic. Maybe some churches have gone under because of the pandemic, but we haven't. The Lord has maintained us. We haven't maintained us. The Lord has maintained us. He has sustained us through this last a year and a half. So in any event, I ask that you test your spiritual health this evening and do what you need to do to maintain and to improve it. And I say this, of course, as I said at the beginning, I'm preaching to the choir tonight, those of you who are faithful, but I'm also preaching to those who are watching online and I'm preaching to those who will see this lesson uh, in the future as well from among uh, our congregation. Uh, this, this lesson is for you as well. So uh, for those who are actually here in the building tonight, if you have uh, uh, any reason to need the prayers of the church, uh, then we encourage you to do that now as Johnny leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing, please? 